We're going to get started. So please, please welcome the commercial staff members from the commercial department. Give them a hand. Okay, can everybody hear me? Welcome. Thank you all so much for coming. We're very excited. And a special thank you to Dennis and the SAC Foundation, who is hosting this program and all the wonderful programs that they put on. Uh, my name is Beth Haynes, and I'm the manager of the commercials department. I have Eddie Barnes, one of our business reps, and Tracy Hyman, who is our, one of our senior business reps. Um, when, uh, when you leave here, we hope you, that you have a basic understanding of commercials, the audition process, the um, working conditions, payment structure, and different types of use. So that's what we're going to cover. We tried to make it simple and basic, and it, we'll have a Q&A at the end if you have any questions. Oh, clicker. OK, so the commercials contract is negotiated um, SAG-AFTRA and the industry, what we call the JPC. It's made up of the um, ANA, the Association of National Advertisers, and the 4As, the American Association of Advertising Agencies. The contract is negotiated every three years, and the current contract, which we just negotiated about a year ago, expires on March 31st. You know what, I'm going to have you do that, okay? Um, TV principal performers, that's what we're going to cover first, principals. Now the first thing, principal performers, the way that they get a job is they go to an audition. So when you go to an audition, the first thing that you need to do is look for the exhibit sign-in sheet. And on that sheet, please sign in, in PIN. Please, if you have a member number, which you're all here, so you have a member number, use your member number. We try not to encourage social security numbers for identity theft problems. Um, under membership also, please do not write on file or on record. We have thousands of members and believe it or not, there's duplicate names. We don't have time to call them and say, were you the performer that went on the Geico audition? So please don't put on file. Um, intended use should also be listed on the uh, exhibit E. That's whether it's gonna run class A, cable, or wild spot. Now, Something important uh, about signing in and signing out, which we stress to our members, please always sign in and sign out. And the reason for that is if a lot of times at auditions, if performers aren't there for more than an hour, they don't sign out. There is payment due for performers who are at an audition for more than an hour. But many times, you know, they'll get in and out in a half an hour, 45 minutes, so they don't think it's necessary to sign in and sign out. But what that does is the day goes on and casting gets a little behind, the performer that is there for an hour or m for more than an hour, when they go to sign out, they see the uh, exhibit E and they, there's no one else that signed out. And so they kind of go, oh, I don't want to sign out. Uh, it's going to look like I'm the only one who was here for more than an hour. They're not going to pick me because now I'm due overtime. So if all our members sign in and sign out, it won't put that one performer you know, looking like they're standing out and they're the, you know, they're the troublemaker, they're the one signing out. So that's the importance of that. And again, um, there's overtime pay. So at the first and second audition, the producer can have you for an hour at no cost. Beyond that first hour, you're paid thirty nine twenty three per half hour. The third audition, there's no payment required unless there are three or more performers per role and there is no performer there on their first audition. If there are, if those conditions do apply, you're paid $156.94 for the first two hours. At the fourth audition, the same rules apply. If there's more than three performers per role or any performer on their first audition, the, the uh, producer has to pay you $313.88. And the importance for this, again, signing in, signing out, um, pension and health is paid on overtime. So we get a lot of calls towards the end of the year about performers, you know, I'm $200 for making my pension, you know, so sign in, sign out, and get that pension applied to your overtime. Oh, additionally, um, if there is a stunt, if you have to perform a stunt at an audition, a stunt coordinator needs to be there as well. 
So then after the audition, they have the performer may be contacted by the casting director about an avail. So what is an avail? A lot of times it's confused with being put on hold. But an avail is just a courtesy. It's when the casting director contacts you or your agent and asks if you're available. Are you available next week, Tuesday, Wednesday? Um, if you get another job, if you're actually booked on another job, not on avail, but if you're actually booked, let the casting director or your agent know so that they can you know, release you and choose somebody else. So what is a principal performer? A principal performer is outlined in section six of our contract. And they are performers that have lines or words. Uh, they perform a stunt. They're in a close-up stationary shot. They also cover group singers, group dancers, and group speakers. Also under section six, under section six C, there are criteria for an upgrade. Now this doesn't necessarily, this does not apply to principals, Principles, they are people who have lines or words. But there are criteria for extra performers if they want to be upgraded. And that is if the performer is in the foreground, not atmospheric, but in the foreground, identifiable, and reacting to the on or off camera message of the commercial. And uh, all three of these criteria need to be met at the same time. So if the commercial opens up and you're in the foreground, but you're not reacting to the message, and then in another, another shot, you're in the background, but you're reacting to the message, that doesn't count as an upgrade. It's all three simultaneously. Downgrades and outgrades. Uh, downgrade is when you're hired as a principal performer, but in the final edit of the commercial, your face no longer remains. You are paid a session fee for this, and um, you have to be notified within 60 days of filming or 15 days from the first airing of the commercial. Additionally, an outgrade, that's when you're hired as a principal performer, but you're completely edited out of the commercial. And if this occurs, there is no payment due. Hey, show me the money. <laughs> show me the money, that's what we all want, right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so an on-camera principal performer, for an eight-hour day, they're paid six twenty-seven seventy-five, which breaks down to seventy-eight forty-seven an hour. Over time, the ninth and 10th hours are paid at time and a half, and the 11th hour on is double. Pension and health is paid at 16.8% and is paid on all compensation. It's not paid on reimbursement like mileage, things like that, but any compensation from work. Um, the exception to overtime would be travel. So for example, you work eight hours and they release you and you travel back two hours, you get paid travel time. Those, those two hours of travel are paid at straight time. That does not put you into overtime. Off-camera voiceover. Off-camera voiceover, they're paid in two-hour increments at 420 or 472. There is no overtime for voiceover work. It's just paid in blocks of two hours. So if you work three hours, you get paid two blocks of the 472, which would be 944. Group rates, as I said earlier, uh, group performers are principal performers. They're just their session and their use fees are paid at a lower rate. Uh, they include on and off camera singers, dancers, and group speakers who speaking lines of dialogue in unison. Cancellation fee, if you're booked and canceled, you're owed for every day that you're, you were booked. So for example, if you were um, booked to travel one day work two days, and then travel back on the fourth day, and you were canceled, you would be due for session fees. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Right, I think we were gonna, I think we were gonna have questions at the end. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, rehearsal, rehearsal is paid at the same rate as your session. So for example, if you rehearse one day, and then work the next day, you're paid the session rate of 627.75 for both days. Uh, holidays. There are eight holidays under the commercial contract. They are New Year's Day, Martin Luther King Jr., President's Day, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and of course, Christmas. Um, they're paid at double scale. So for example, the example on screen, performer works eight hours on a Saturday, 
they're paid the 627.75 and then they're paid an additional 627.75. The additional payment is it's a premium for working on the weekend. Fittings, fitting on a non-work day, uh, fittings are a one hour minimum, paid at 78.47. Any additional time is paid in 15 minute increments at 19.62. Wardrobe fees for non-evening wear, uh, the performers paid $17.65. Evening wear is $29.45, and you are paid per costume, not per costumes brought. Um, Eddie will be covering the extra section, and it is different from principals to extras. Principals get paid for what they actually wear, sort of like a cleaning or maintenance fee, whereas extras are paid for every, uh, every outfit that they're asked to bring by the producer. Meal breaks. Um, meal breaks are given every six hours. If the performer's not broke for a meal, the first half hour they're paid $25, the second half hour $25, and the third half hour and thereafter they're paid $50. The example that we have is an AD calls a meal break seven hours after signing in, the performer would be due $50. There are exceptions and that would be if you're in the middle of a take, but Generally, the, the take runs maybe five or ten minutes. The producers are pretty good about either breaking you on time or, you know, it goes over an hour or so. <clears throat> uh, meal period violations are not assessed during unsupervised travel. So what that means is if you work eight hours and they, the producer releases you at that eight hour, eighth hour and then you get in your car and you drive home, they're not responsible for that because you can pull over and get something to eat. We hope. Uh, meal per diems, these are for overnight locations. Breakfast, uh, the performers paid $15. Lunch is $25. Dinner, $40, which is a total of $80. If any meal is provided, then of course you're not, you're not given the money for that. So if they feed you breakfast and lunch, but not dinner, then you get the dinner per diem. When do I get paid? That's, that's important. Okay, so the session fee is due, it's due to be postmarked um, by the 12th business day after you work. Holding fees are due on the first date, due to be postmarked the first date of that holding fee cycle. Tracy is going to talk about use cycles, fixed cycles, and, and all the, that sort of payment stuff. But holding fees due the first day of the fixed cycle. Residuals are due 15 business days from the first use. Um, if you do not receive your check, check with your agent first and see if they have it. Um, in, the, in the event that, that you don't get paid, there are late fees that are assessed at $3.60 per day up to 25 business days. Residuals, how they work. That's complicated. So for that, we're going to have Tracy. This is more money, lots, hopefully, more money. Um, this applies to principals only. Extras performers do not receive um, residuals. So a session fee and a holding fee. The session fee is what you're paid when you work. It has to be paid within 12 business days um, from when you work. It acts as two things. One, it pays you for the work you do, but it also holds you exclusive to whatever product, the direct conflict of the product, um, and it maintains that for 13 weeks. A commercial has a lifespan of 21 months that are divided into seven 13-week cycles. So the first payment is the session payment, but every 13 weeks after that, you get what's called the holding fee, which is equivalent to a session fee. It acts as also holds you exclusive to the product. It gives the um, ad agency or advertiser the right to use the product for the, the commercial for the next 13 weeks. And it also kind of acts like a down payment towards any use that is going to be played during the next 13 weeks. And I'll explain more of that as we go. So this is a sample um, session check. Uh, the talent partner, this is from Talent Partners, which pays probably about 75% of the commercials. So this is one of the main checks that you'll see. Um, they're always set up the same. You'll see um, over here, it'll say ad agency. That'll give you, you should match what's on your contract unless they've transferred the rights. 
Down here under use type, that's the most important part. And this is going to be for all checks. The first line will show you the payment type. So in this one, it's a session. It'll tell you the 13 weeks that this applies to. And in this particular check, it's October of 2013 to January of 2014. Um, and it'll show you again the usage type. So when we're talking residuals, these will all change. The other important piece is all the way on the far right, you'll see maximum period of use, and that'll tell you the full 21 months or when the commercial expires, if they continue to pay you the holding fees throughout the whole time. Um, as I said, there's a 21 month um, maximum period of use. To and avoid the advertising agency having the opportunity to roll over the commercial for another 21 months at scale, if you or your agent sends a letter to the advertising agency 60 to 120 days prior to the MPU date, and you notify them that we'd love for you to reuse our commercial, but you need to contact us to renegotiate, that's your opportunity when you go into your second 21 month cycle to try and get more than scaled, scale and a half, double scale, a guarantee, how use is going to be applied, that's your chance to play with the numbers. Um, so we have a number of types of residuals. Class A, wild spot, dealer, cable, and Spanish language and se seasonal all apply to television use. The other ones, theatrical and industrial, internet, new media, and foreign um, are not based on, the tele on broadcast on television. Um, as I said, TV is paid in 13-week cycles. There are seven of them. Internet and new media, they can either buy a one-year period or several eight-week periods. Um, a dealer use, which I'll explain later what that is, can either be paid in eight-week use periods or six-month period. And then theatrical and foreign both cover the full 21 months of the contract. So you'll get one check at the beginning of the cycle if they start using it right away after you've shot it, and you won't get another payment for those. Um, until the end if they start to roll over the commercial. Okay, class A use. This is the one that everyone thinks is the money getter. Um, this is when you're paid per use. Now, it's usually impossible to tell from seeing your commercial whether it is running class A or not. Um, but the way it works is the week is Monday through Sunday, and they have 15 business days on the Monday following the Sunday to issue the check. So it's a rolling period throughout the cycle. If they're buying Class A, they could buy one week of Class A and not buy any more for that cycle. So there's no guarantee if you get three Class A payments that you're going to get more throughout the cycle. But if they are running it, they will continue going. It's on a decreased scale. Um, and let me give you, we can go to the scale. So for example, if you have a commercial that runs on the NBA, and, it's a, and you're in a Dove commercial, it says NBA, um, brought to you by Dove, and the very next commercial is a Dove commercial, pretty much that's going to be a Class A because they're sponsoring the program. Um, another example would be if you're watching Grey's Anatomy, and every single person across the country watching that episode of Grey's Anatomy sees your commercial in the exact same commercial time block, that's most likely going to be Class A. Um, so if you get a check that says, um, you can, I'll show you an example. On this, it'll say, um, Class A 1 through 20. So that means it ran 20 times during this period. They will have at the bottom of the check the particular days that it ran. They'll have the specific dates. So you'll see they, in this one it's 20 uses. So the first use is paid at scale, 627.75. The second use is 143.95. Each use between 3 and 13 is 114.20. So they'll multiply 11 by the 114. And then uses 14 through 20 are at $54.75 for each unit. And beyond that is 54.75. So the checks will tell you how many uses it's paying for that particular week. And then it'll break down the payment structure. Um, OK, so Wild Spot is also on broadcast. Class A is on NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, or the CW. Same as Wild Spot. The difference is Wild Spot's when they pick and choose the markets or the cities that they're going to air it in. So my favorite example, because I'm from the East Coast, is Dunkin' Donuts, which I hear in 2016 we'll be getting. 
but until that, I will use it as an example. So um, Dunkin' Donuts isn't going to buy time out here. They're only going to buy Boston, Washington, D.C., Miami, Orlando, West Palm Beach. Um, so when your friends on the East Coast are watching Grey's Anatomy and they see a Dunkin' Donut commercial, we'll probably be seeing a Carl's Jr. commercial. Um, that means it's a wild spot. So you're going to get paid for the cities that it's airing in. Every city has a unit value based on the population. They add up all those unit values, and then it, we have a magical book that somebody did the math for us, and it comes out to a set amount of money. You'll get paid that amount of money at the beginning of the cycle, and they have unlimited use of the commercial in those cities for that set amount of money, and you won't get any more. So every time your mom in Florida you know, turns on the TV and on Channel 4 always sees your commercial, you're not buying her a new house, sadly. <laughs> um, it's one payment. Now, the other thing is, when it's on, if it's on, for example, Grey's Anatomy, again, that's how you're not going to know if it's Class A or Wild Spot. Because if you're seeing it on Grey's Anatomy, that doesn't mean the whole country is, just because it's airing on a primetime show. So that's when you start checking your, twi your Twitter, 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 um, your Facebook, your Instagram, all your friends who are emailing, you go, oh my god, I saw your commercial. Keep track of those. Because that'll give you an idea of where it's airing, so you can get kind of an idea if you're going to be getting Class A payments or if it's really only going to be Wild Spot. Um, for Wild Spot check, again, it'll say the cycle, the 13-week cycle. And under usage type, on this one, it'll say, it says Wild Spot, New York, LA, Chicago, zero. That means it's not playing in any other cities but the three majors, which are New York, LA, and Chicago. If it was running in anywhere else, it would say, you know, New York plus seven, or if it wasn't running in any of the majors, it could say wild spot 37. So that's where you're going to be able to tell where exactly it's running. Um, okay, dealer use. This is when you do the Toyota commercial, and everybody across the country sees it, and you get all excited, and then you find out it's a dealer use. And what that means is the Toyota company manufacturer created a commercial. And then they sold it to all of their little dealerships that are connected to them. And so the dealerships all over the country are going to air the commercial. They might change the tag on the end or what the special is, but it's the same commercial everywhere. That gets paid either at six months use or an eight week use option. So people will say, I see your commercial everywhere, but you'll get a dealer use check that covers a full six months. You're not getting wild spot or class A for that. It'll look like wild spot because it's in all different cities, but because the main manufacturer made it and then distributed it to its dealers, you're only going to get that one check for that period of time. And you are paid whether they use the spot or not. As soon as they ship it to one of their dealers, you'll get paid. Um, cable use. So cable is all the other stations. Um, for cable use, you, cannot, you can cannot credit the session fee or the holding fee. With these other types, Wild Spot and Class A, they're allowed to apply the session fee or the holding fee to the use for that cycle. So like I said, it's a down payment on use. So you're getting your session fee, but then you might see on your check for Wild Spot minus 627.75, because in their mind, they already paid you that, they get to subtract it out. For cable use, they're not allowed to. Again, it's in 13-week cycles, and just like Wild Spot, you get paid once at the beginning of the 13-week cycle, and you don't get anything else. Um, this year, this past year, in negotiations, we raised the unit value from 2,000 to 3,000 units. So now the max you'll be paid is 3,000 units. So even if they buy 6,000 units of cable, um, and each cable channel has a unit value, you get capped out at 3,000. But again, you'll see it on every cable channel, but you won't get any more money for that 13 weeks. Um, okay. Oh, and cable, so here, this one is a max cable. So you'll see over here, it'll say cable 3000. If it wasn't, it would be like cable 572. And again, like Wild Spot, each cable run, each set of units has a different amount of money. So it'll show the breakdown of how many were paid at each of the values. Then there's also made for cable only. And that's when it's not airing Wild Spot or broadcast. It's only going to be on cable. Um, holding fees are now required. It used to be that there weren't holding fees, but now as of 2000, 
nine contract, you do get holding fees, which means every 13 weeks, as long as they want to use the commercial, you'll get an equivalent of the session payment. Um, theatrical and industrial exhibition, that's like when you're commercial, when you go to the movies and you see your commercial before the movie. Or you go, the, it's on the Jumbotron, or you go to a sports stadium and it's on there. Or you go to Target and it's on the little kiosk next to the product. That's theatrical industrial use, which is different than B-roll, which is under the industrial contract. So it's two totally different things. They just happen to use the same term. So for theatrical industrial use, it covers the full 21 months. Um, you'll get one payment if they decide to do it that way, and it'll cover all use. Um, next is internet and new media. There are two ways that they can shoot an internet and new media commercial. They can either do a made for internet only, which has a slightly lesser um, payment structure, or they can shoot it for television, move it over to the internet, and then these are the rates for the move over. They can use any combination of one year and eight weeks, but if they take any break in between, they can only do that as long as they've been paying holding fees. If they're going to run it consistently, they don't have to pay holding fees for internet. But the minute they want to run it for a month or eight weeks, take an eight-week break and then run it for a year, they have to pay holding fees to be able to use it now. Um, Spanish language. There are two ways Spanish language can be paid. Either wild spot, like I explained, but this would be um, based on a different set of values because of the cities where the market is. Or program use, which is on the main um, Spanish language, language stations. Um, it's similar to Class A, but it's not played per use. It's on Telemundo and Telefuturo, which are the main channels, but they pay a set fee for the 13 weeks use. Um, and there's also specific foreign use under the Spanish language based on um, countries in Central America, South America, and Mexico. Um, okay, and they also are allowed, if you do a Spanish language commercial, they, when they pay you for residual, when they hold you exclusive, it's only in the Spanish language market. It's not in the English language market unless they pay you an additional 50% to also hold you for the English market. Um, and if they ask you on set to translate the script from either English to Spanish or Spanish to English, you do get an additional fee for doing that. They can't just ask you out of the goodness of your heart to spend time translating. Um, next is seasonal commercials. They're only real seasons. In the office, we often refer to the National Cookie Day, but sadly, that's not a real holiday, apparently. Um, so the main holiday is Christmas, Valentine's Day. Oddly enough, back to school, I believe, is a holiday season. <laughs> um, there's a wedding season, but other, other like, apparently no food can have a season. Um, for, if it's a seasonal commercial, they'll run it for that period. They have to tell you when they hire you. They'll run it for that period of time. There's no holding fees. But if they want the right to use it at the next season, so if it's Christmas and they want to use it the following year at Christmas, they have to pay you an equivalent of a session fee at the end of the run. And that only gives them the right to use it again. It doesn't hold you exclusive. It just tells you that they're probably going to use it again at the next season. Um, okay, foreign use. Um, if it's foreign only, then the session fee may not be credited. There's no exclusivity under foreign use. Uh, they, it's a full 21 months, but they are allowed to extend it to an additional nine months for an additional fee. The foreign use covers television, theatrical, industrial, but it does not cover internet. So if they say, oh, well, we're just putting on a Spanish you know, website, it's called the World Wide Web for a reason. Anyone can access it. So they do also have to pay an extra, a separate internet fee. Foreign use doesn't cover that. Um, next is editing, where it, when they make a commercial, a 60 second commercial, you'll often see a shorter version, like a 30 second. Everything that's in the 30 second is contained within the 60. They're allowed to do that. It's called a mechanical edit. And they don't have to pay you any additional because it's purely done in the cutting room. And it counts as one for use purposes. So wherever any any of the commercial errors, it counts as one commercial and you get paid for all use in one bulk. Now they're allowed at this point to make a, third, a second edit, a third cut, which would be another shorter or longer version, also only done in the editing room. They cannot add any footage. 
They pay you one additional session fee for that second cut, and then they can use it, again, all three will count for use purposes as one commercial. But you do now get an additional session fee for that second shorter version. And that's how principals get their money. So Eddie's gonna talk to you about extras. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Eddie Barnes and I am a proud sag after member since 1970. No longer performing, of course. I'm going to talk to you about extras. Um, first of all, who is considered an extra? Uh, extras are, f as it says here, foreground atmosphere, extra work, crowd work, stand-ins, photo doubles, hand models, and omnis. Uh, hand models are paid a little differently. They're paid more than your standard extra pay, but they have a lot of additional wear and tear and things that they have to take care of, like manicures and such. Omnis, if you're not sure what that is, those are words that are atmospheric words that people use, like ooh or ah. You're allowed to do that, and it doesn't rise you up to the level of a principal, unfortunately. Crowd work. Uh, the producer has to employ 45 registered uh, union extras for work when they use crowds. Anything over the 45, they are allowed to use non-union extras. Um, now, hiring an extra performer, when are you booked? Okay, you're booked when you've been notified of a specific date to report. Now, at the time of the hiring, when you're booked, they're supposed to tell you some things. First, they're supposed to tell you the type of work that you're doing. Smoke work, wet work, stand-in work. You need to know that in advance, and also the number of commercials, because as an extra, and as a principal, if you, do, if you shoot more than one spot on a day, you get paid extra for that. Um, no one is supposed to be hired on account of personal favoritism by the casting directors for extra work. We, there's, it's difficult for us to prove something like that, but if you find that the extra is also living with the casting director and that person is used all the time, it may give you some indication that something's not quite right. Uh, also, very important is that uh, you may not earn less than sag after minimum rate for your work. If you have an agent who you're working with, if they're going to collect a commission, that has to be on top. You cannot invade your salary to pay an agent's commission. Okay, upgrades. Uh, this was spoken about earlier a little bit. This is one of the questions and one of the claims that I get more often than anything else, truly. Um, in order to be upgraded, for an extra to be upgraded, your performance has to be foreground. And that doesn't just mean in the front. It means the focus of the commercial. You can be standing in front of the principal and still not be a principal performer because the three criteria, the uh, performance has to be foreground, your face has to be identifiable. So if you're blurry, if you're turned to the side and not much of your face is showing, and, the, and also you have to be demonstrating or illustrating the product or reacting to the on or off camera narration or the uh, commercial message. You've got to meet all three criteria. If you don't, then you're not going to be upgradable. However, if you feel that you are, then you need to contact us, send in a claim, and then we investigate and see if we feel that it meets the criteria so that we can advocate for you and go after the, print, go after the upgrade for you. Um, now, the director is allowed to give you directions on the set. They're allowed to tell you to do this or do that. That's different than theatrical. Theatrical, if you're given direction, you're bumped up. In, in commercials, they are allowed to do that. Also, the length of time that you're, that you're on screen is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. You can be there for almost the blink of an eye, but if, you're, if you meet the three criteria within that short period of time, you should be upgraded. Okay, now it's time to talk money, what you can expect in your paycheck. Uh, extras for an eight-hour day is $342.40. Uh, the 13-week rate and the extension rate are really for seasonal commercials, as they just explained. Um, overtime, same thing as for uh, principals. The ninth hour is at time and a half, the 10th hour is at time and a half, 11th to 16th hour is double time, and then 16 hours, we have the rule of 16 hours. If you're working 16 hours or more, every hour that you work past the 16, you get a full session fee. So at, eight, at, at 16 hours, you get a full session, 17 hour, you get another full session, 18 hour, another full session. You can make a lot of money, but you can also drop dead from it. <laughs> Okay, uh, mileage, flat mileage, yeah, $8 a day within the studio zone. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, the studio zone is a 30-mile radius from the corner of Beverly Boulevard and La Cienica. Uh, now, travel from one location to a second location is covered by the $8. You don't get any more than that. However, if you travel outside of the zone, the distance between 
ending, the end of the zone and your location and back again, it's paid in half hour units of uh, $10.70 per half hour for the time, plus mileage at 56 cents a mile, which is the federal minimum right now. Night premium, if you work from 8, 8 p.m. to 1 a.m., you get an additional 10% bump in your salary. And uh, 1 a.m. to 6 a.m., you get an additional 20% per hour. Cancellations. Okay, this again is if you were told a specific t date to report. Um, if you're booked and you aren't used, you do your session fee. Uh, the only exception to that would be if there's an illness to a principal performer, a fire, or some kind of a national emergency. Uh, rehearsals. Uh, rehearsal, rehearsal scale is the same as a session fee. If you go in one day and work, you get paid for a day's pay, whether you're rehearsing or shooting. No difference whatsoever. Uh, Saturdays and Sundays and holidays, same holidays as for principals, and it's paid at double time, just like the principal salaries. We can skip on to the next one. This is very, a lot of this is repetitious, I'm sorry to do that, but a lot of the contract is parallel. Wardrobe fitting, $17.95 per costume. $29.90 for uh, evening wear or a period costume, uh, $85.60 for two hours of a fitting, and $36.90 if you have glued pieces or makeup that covers 50% of your body. Uh, and again, as um, I believe Beth was saying, if you, um, you're paid on the number of outfits that you bring as an extra, not the number of outfits that are used. Meal breaks are due every six hours, just like the principals. It's a $25 for the first half hour beyond the six hours, 25 for the second half hour, and $50 for the third and beyond that. Well, we also have what we call a non-deductible meal. What that means is if you go to the set and then they serve you breakfast, that can be a half hour to an hour. That first half hour or hour would not be counted as work time. It's non-deducted from the work time, but they're providing you a meal when you get there, so that's why they're permitted to do that. But then the next meal break is six, six hours after the end of the non-deductible meal. Okay, dollars, when do I get paid? <laughs> the same thing is for principals. It's uh, within, tw the session payment is within 12 working days from the time of your employment. And if they don't pay you on time, uh, any anything beyond that is $3.60 per working day for up to 25 days, which would be $90. And that's from the day the check is cut. It's not necessarily when you have it in your hand. So check the date when the check is processed. That's what they use. Okay, now I want to talk briefly about radio. Uh, radio auditions, first of all. Uh, the first hour of an audition for a radio commercial is free. The first or second audition over the first hour is $30 uh, paid in half hour increments. And the third and subsequent call, if you have to go back several times, which is unusual in radio, but sometimes it happens, is $60 for the first hour and then $30 for each additional half hour. Now, radio sessions are based on a 90-minute call. It's a 90-minute session. Uh, we have the rates here for an actor or an announcer or solo. It's two seventy-eight sixty, And we have group singers or speakers. The singers are included in this, uh, and the rates are there. Uh, payment again within 12 working days, and the minimum call is no more than 90 minutes. Now, if they want to use you beyond the 90 minutes, they pay, again, another session fee for the next block of 90 minutes because that's how they have to buy it, in blocks of 90 minutes. And pension and health is just as is uh, regular uh, as an on-camera commercial, 16.8%. Now, the interesting thing with radio is that there are, there's really no exclusivity. So you can do as much radio as you want. Sometimes it's a little different for people who are earning way over scale or celebrities. They will contract with uh, the celebrity or the overscale performer uh, to, to make up for the fact that they do want uh, exclusivity. They can have it, but uh, it's, for most people, there is no exclu exclusivity in, in uh, radio. Um, it's the holding fees that hold the exclusivity. And cancellations. Uh, a performer is paid in full for any canceled session. Uh, if it's postponed for another day, you get paid for the day that you were booked for the same number of commercials, for the same amount of time. Whether If they book you for two sessions, you're going to get paid for your two sessions. Now, radio is also used on the Internet and uh, new media. And just like uh, on-camera commercials, there's an eight-week option and a one-year option. Three seventy fifty-five if they want to use it for just eight weeks, and one year at nine seventy-five ten. 
Now, if they want to take a regular, a commercial that's already been aired on, over, the, over terrestrial radio or, or broadcast radio and then do it over the Internet, we have a move-over rate, just like in uh, on-camera commercials of eight weeks at four seventeen ninety and one year at $1,114, pardon me, and 40 cents. And that's, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, this last page here, things to remember, our contact numbers, 323-549-6858. Uh, and after hours at 323-954-1600. Very important point. If you have a problem on the set, don't put yourself in a bad position. It's better you should just basically keep your mouth shut, give us a call, and we'll take care of it. Uh, if things are really bad for some reason, we'll send out a rep. We'll send a field rep out. Uh, we want you to be able to work for these same producers over and over and over again. We don't want you to blow any chances of future employment. That's why we're here to be the bad guys. That's what we do. Uh, but just need to remember, if you're going to file a claim, you have a six-month deadline from this, for session-related claims you know, if, to make sure. We, by, con by contract, we can't go after a claim that's more than six months old. So you need to help us out there. And if you have a claim, report it as quickly as you can. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me? All right, we're gonna go through these uh, questions. Okay. I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, I haven't even read this one yet. Okay, when auditioning, can I request a different scene partner if the scene partner I'm working with can't act <laughs> and can't take direction? Wow. That's a good question. You know what? It, it's really up to the casting director. And it's, I mean, we don't have any language in our contract that even addresses that. So, you know, I would say just if you could whisper to them, you know, can I have a different partner? You know, maybe they'll do it. But you just have to do the best you can in the situation that you're in. That's what I would suggest. So thank you. Okay, I have a question about iSpot uh, TV, which is one of my pet peeves. Um, iSpot TV is, I don't know if any of you have gone to it, is iSpot TV, I mean iSpot.tv, I think. And what it has are commercials that they pull off the television, mm -hmm. and they will identify sometimes the ad agency. They'll identify the alleged last use of it. They'll say, you know, whatever TV show at what time or 60 minutes ago it aired. And then at the bottom, it'll say 1,000 uses, 1,000 airings. And then we get the call, oh my god, 1,000 airings. How much am I going to make? This is so exciting. <laughs> And it doesn't say whether it's cable or Class A or Wild Spot. And you can pay, I think, $90 or something, and they'll tell you the breakdown of all the channels. First of all, there's nothing that's 100%. Even the monitoring that we use, um, which we have found through a lot of research is one of the better ones, is still not 100%. iSpot TV doesn't break it down. So if you see a 1,000 uses, that does not mean you're going to get a paid 1,000 Class A uses. It could mean they bought cable, and they're airing it every single time on ESPN whenever there's a commercial break. That could be your 1,000 uses. You're getting paid for cable. That's it. It doesn't matter. So though iSpot can give you an idea of if your commercials run, if you haven't seen it yet, please don't rely on it as a source to call your agent and say, oh my god, I'm so not getting paid what I'm supposed to be getting paid. We need to file 12 claims, and we're done. Um, because we still need a date, time, and station. If you truly believe that you've seen it on cable and you haven't gotten a single cable payment, you want to file a claim, we need a date, time, and station that you've seen it or that your friend has Facebooked you about for us to jump off in our research. We can't just blindly go into the world of commercials and say, did this commercial ever run? Um, we need a date, time, and station. So iSpot TV is a great concept, but um, it is far from gospel. Okay, I have a question regarding international industrial use. You're paid for all US domestic use, but then the spot is used in international industrial use. Should I be paid for the international use? Yes. You do get paid, you do have to be paid for industrial use of a commercial. 
I mean, international use of a commercial, which includes the industrial use of it. So yes, there is payment for that. Um, I have a couple more questions on iSpot that I just want to, I skipped a couple of things. It'll say national at the top. All that means is it can run all over the country. It doesn't mean that it is running all over the country. It just means it's not regional. And every commercial that, air, that I've seen on iSpot miraculously is national. So uh, that means nothing. A national and a national spot mean nothing. That term is not in the commercials contract. It's either it's class A or it's wild spot or you're being hired under a regional contract like a maiden played in in St. Louis or something. But national mean, and if you see national written on a breakdown, that only means it has the opportunity to run across the country, not that it will. And is there another, you know, Kantar Media, who we use, I know used to have available for individuals to I hire them. I they still do. And, and they may still, again, that's not even 100%. Um, so, I mean, you can do it, but there is no guarantee of any of these monitoring systems. This past year, we've got Ad ID added into our contract. And the hope is that by the end of the month, all commercials will have an Ad ID and there will be some sort of clearinghouse and hopefully someday we'll be able to track those ad IDs to know how they're airing. And so that's sort of why it was developed. But at this point, there really is no way to know. Right. And in, in the last negotiations, we uh, got that language into the contract that um, ad agencies use ad ID. It's a universal coding system. Whereas before, that was our, our trouble with monitoring commercials is that you know, ad agencies had different uh, combinations of, of coding. This is a universal coding system, so that we hope that it will pick it will pick everything up. That monitoring will there'll be a system where it can pick up this universal code. I had a question. Um, here is if I translate a voiceover uh, audition, am I owed any money? Yes, I think um, uh, Tracy covered that about yes, you are paid for translation services. Okay. Um, wow, people are just hitting my pet peeves tonight. Um, unbelievable. Okay, so the question is, can anything be done about background commercial casting companies who call themselves talent listing services and charge union background actors fees to sign up and 10% and of their SAG after commercial earnings? Um, this has been going on for a while. And what happened was the um, city attorney issued, I think it was like three or four years ago, a statement about who could collect money and who couldn't. And they determined that casting directors could charge a minimal amount just for administrative processing, getting you in the computer, hiring the person to put it in the computer, like $40. They, lost, they started saying, wait a second, we're not making money off of this anymore. So some industrious person decided I'm going to pretend I'm not related to this casting company, and I'm going to open a business over here where instead of registering directing directly with the casting director, we are now going to have you join us. And the only way that this casting director is going to get people now is through this second company. And unfortunately, the way the city attorneys, um, the way the laws are written, it doesn't touch them. There are, this second company can charge for things. Um, so they're charging 10% of SAG-AFTRA um, extra salaries. Whenever you get a job, they're going to ask you for 10% back. We have filed some claims on it. We've been successful on some of them. The argument being that these are the hiring, the casting director is the hiring agent of the signatory, and if the, hire, if the hiring agent's using these people, then the, cast, the advertising agency should know what's going on with everybody. Um, I know that's kind of how you're getting jobs now. There are still some casting directors that are having registrations and things. I, I would recommend, not recommend going there because it's really hard to fight these other people. We can't stop them. We have no legal relationship with casting directors or these third party people. So we can't call them up and say, you know you're invading scale, stop it. They don't care what we're saying and the city attorney can't touch them. So we know they exist, we don't like it, we file claims when we can. If we can show that 99% of the background hired 
were hired through that company so that there was no other way anyone could have gotten the job other than going through this company, we can try and file. If it's one person who went there and one person got hired over here and one person over there, then you can't show that a requirement of hire. So yeah, they're icky, but, um, and we try. Okay, um, is there a premium rate for fit if fittings are on a weekend or on any of the eight holidays? This would be for a principal performer, and yes, um, weekend work is weekend work. Work is paid at double time on the weekends. Well, yeah, yeah? that's correct. Well, our position is that it's double. We don't actually have language. <laughs> position and past precedence, we, we say that it's double. A uh, question is, is there a potential conflict if you are an identifiable extra, non-reaction in the foreground? Um, there's no, well, there's no conflict, no. But if you work as an extra performer on a um, Samsung phone commercial, we don't recommend that you go out uh, a principal audition for a Motorola. I mean, you're putting yourself in, in a bad position. Certainly, if you work as a principal performer on a Samsung commercial, don't do extra work for Motorola. Just don't even put yourself in that position. You're getting paid holding fees by Samsung to not do competitive spots. Regardless that it's an extra role, just don't do that. It, it puts yourself in a bad position. <clears throat> For the past four years, I've noticed fewer honey wagons. Did we lose that? We never had it. Um, <laughs> we had, you can't get dressed in a bathroom, and we still have that, but we've never had hugging wagons. Honestly, it's just the economy. They're not spending the money that they used to be. Um, so it, there's no requirement that they have honey wagons. There never was. Sorry. Is there a deadline for uh, residual related claims? Yes, we still follow the six month rule, but it's from notice, when you notice that your claim is late, when your check is late, approximately six months. It's not written down, I don't believe it's written down on the contract for residual related claims, but that's what we follow. Six, six months. It's still six months, yeah. Okay, uh, a question, uh, why is it so hard to ask commercial producers to provide a contract to background actors when they are upgraded to a principal role? Um, yeah, the reason is you're hired as, let's say you're hired as an extra, you get that contract. Then they decide to upgrade you. They don't, we don't have language in our contract that says they have to provide you with a new principal contract, but the fact that they've paid you the difference from an extra to a principal, that's good enough. You have your original employment contract. You may have not been upgraded except in editing post your work date. So it's not a requirement that they do give you a new principal contract. And, and I've, I've, I've heard several stories where, the, you know, the AD or the second AD comes up and says, oh, we're going to upgrade you in this commercial, and they don't give you the contract, and it doesn't happen, and we can't hold them to it. Yeah, if I had a dime for every time I heard, <laughs> I wouldn't be here. <laughs> yes, she would. Um, okay. If your national commercial has at least five to six different versions, are there additional fees paid? If they are not the shorter or longer versions, like I spoke of, of the purely in the editing room versions, um, yes. However, if the versions you're talking about, it's a car commercial, and at the end, it's just changing the APR or whatever percentage or your loan rate or something, then probably not. If it's changing the phone number or some geographical piece of information or changing the website, probably not. But if there's new footage added in and the footage has changed and the different voiceover, then yes, those will each be versions that you should be compensated for. Okay. Um, is there anything we can do or SAG can do to bring non-union commercial work back to the union incentives? Um, you know, organizing is a top priority at the union. We recently um, acquired um, an organizer who is in the New York office, and he is working diligently with, you know, casting directors, talent agents. He's reaching out to all sorts of people to get more work union. Um, we in the commercials department, sometimes we'll get notices. Uh, performers will call. They'll say, you know, I'm looking on LA Casting or 
my agent received a breakdown and it's Target and it's non-union, we will do everything we can to contact if there's an uh, ad agency of record or if we know the casting director and we'll call them and you know we'll inquire you know is there any way this can go union uh, sometimes the non-union work it pays pretty well so there's really no reason why we can't call and say you know you're offering twenty thousand dollars for when your buyout is you know use our members use our members that are professional you know they'll, they'll do your job better They'll make you look good. So we do everything we can to organize. And, you know, it's a continuing effort, and we're doing a lot of outreach and doing, um, you know, we're doing a lot of work on it. So, yes, definitely, we want more union work, I'm sure, as much as you do. Okay. Um, is there not a provision in the contract for an upgrade for background when the background is in the foreground in a close-up uh, and recognizable without applying the three criteria. Yes, that is an exception. If you're in a, if you're in a close-up, and you're reacting to still reacting and everything, yes, you will be uh, you can be upgraded to a principal in this situation. That is the uh, the exception to it. Um, okay, I have a question about our claim resolution process. Okay, so you keep track via Facebook and Twitter, and it appears your spot is running wild. You've even seen, I assume, I don't know if that means wild spot or it's just running wild. <laughs> it's nuts. Um, you've even seen it yourself. You've even seen it yourself. You're not paid. You file a claim. SAG investigates and determines you're right. The ad agency disagrees. It happens. I mean, as I said, Kantar Media, when we do our monitoring, it's not always 100%. If you guys see it and you send us a date, time, and station, we will give that date, time, and station to the advertising agency. And if they say, oh no, we never ran it, we'll require them to go and get a station log from us to prove that it didn't run. What happens sometimes is they just go back and look at their media buy and say, oh no, we didn't buy that, it can't be possibly running. And we'll say, could you go back again and talk to the media people, because something may have happened. Um, and then they'll go back and say, oh, they forgot to tell us. Or they'll get the station log, and it'll either have been a make good, meaning it was supposed to air something out someplace else, and a hurricane happened, so they had to move all the commercials, and they had to run them at different times. Or they'll go, yep, we ran it, forgot to tell you. So we do, when they come back and say no, and we have somebody who actually saw it, then we, we'll make them go back and get a station log. Oh, and the timeline is, as long as we're still communicating mm -hmm. <laughs> and they haven't stopped responding to us, we'll let, it, we'll let it keep going. As long as we know they're still looking into it and they're getting back to us and touching base, once we get radio silence, that's when we're more likely to maybe throw it up to legal and have a more threatening letter sent. But as long as we're still in having dialogue, we'll keep it within our department. Um, let's see, if an advertiser chooses to use a commercial the following year, Oh, this is a seasonal question. So if the advertiser chooses to use the commercial the following year and pays a holding fee, is there a conflict if the actor shoots a commercial uh, similar to the commercial? For example, Sam's, I'm, I guess, I'm guessing it's Sam's Club versus Costco. No, there's no exclusivity for seasonal commercials. So that's fine. Um, okay. I recently shot a national commercial, but my scene wasn't used when it aired but I was told that production is sending me a check for a holding fee. What does this mean and how does it work? So if they cut their first, if you shoot your footage as a principal performer, you get your holding fee. That doesn't mean they're necessarily gonna use that footage right then. They could cut one commercial because they're gonna do a slow rollout of the campaign or they wanna present one particular aspect of the footage they shot. As long as they're paying you holding fees, they have the right to make a commercial out of it and to use that commercial, and you can't do a competing product. That certainly could mean that they'll never make a commercial out of it, and you'll never get residuals, and you'll only get the 627.75 every 13 weeks. But that, I mean, that's a risk with any commercial. You could shoot it, and then they, you know, the FDA could cancel the drug that you shot the commercial for, and it never airs, and all you got was your session. So it's always a risk that you take with any commercial. But as long as they're paying you the holding fee, there's the potential that they'll make a commercial out of it and air it. And then that kind of button hooks right up to this one. If you're eliminated from a commercial as a principal, but the agency says, quote, we will retain the rights to your performance, which may be utilized in an upcoming production, should I get a holding fee? 
Well, of course, they can't hold you for anything for nothing. I mean, they have to be, once they've released you or downgraded you or outgraded you, game over. You know, unless they're paying you holding fees. Wow, that shocks me. <laughs> Somebody would even do that. Shocks you? It shocks me. Yes, He's shocks new me. He's <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is the difference between a waiver and a Taft-Hartley, and how many union commercials can you do as a non-union performer before you must join? What the Taft-Hartley form is, that's when the producer hires a performer who's not a member. They have to fill out the Taft-Hartley form, and on the form explain why out of, you know, 60,000, 100,000 members, they chose a non-member a performer who is not a member of the union. Um, there's, I'm not sure what the waiver is. I think maybe they're saying the Taft-Hartley waiver form. If the reason for hire is not, you know, valid, like if they were shooting in LA and they needed a surfer dude. We have plenty of surfer dudes in LA. So that's not a valid reason. We could send a fine to the the ad agency. Um, how many, how many, uh, times can you work for a, the first time as a principal performer in a commercial, you're SAG eligible. For extra performers, it's three, three roles or three working days and you're SAG eligible. Um, is the use paid per TV station for Class A and is theatrical use paid per theater? No, for theater, for industrial use, it's one payment and they can use it in every jumbotron, in every sports stadium, in every single movie theater across um, the United States and Canada and parts of Mexico um, for that one flat rate. For Class A, it's per airing. So it's, I guess the answer is yes and no. So it could air on NBC and CBS. It, that's going to be use one and two. And it could air on CBS three times and that would be use three, one, two, three. So. It's the number of uses. It's ir irrelevant what TV station it's airing on. It counts how many times it airs collectively during that week on all of the five major networks. I hope that explained it. Okay. Um, how do you go about sending in a renegotiation notice for your commercial? Um, 60 to 120 days prior to the MPU, the maximum period of, of use. 21 months, 60 to 120 days prior to that last day, either you or your agent need to send in a letter of renegotiation. It's very, very important. If you don't send in, you or your agent don't send in that notice, the uh, producer can roll your commercial over for another 21 month period at the same rate, and that could be scale. If you or your agent send in that letter of renegotiation, then the producer has to co go to you or your agent and say, We'd like to run your commercial again. We will pay you scale and a half. You can say, great, I love scale and a half. Or you can say, I'd like double scale. Or I'd like a $5,000 per cycle guarantee. That's how you make you know, more money if they want to use the commercial. Um, also, if, you're, if you have an agent, if you're represented by an agent, and they do not send that letter in, and the commercial does roll over its scale, your agent doesn't get commission. Mm. Mm. They have to work for it. Yes. Um, I think I understand what this question is asking. Regarding the mechanical edits, it doesn't matter if the 60 runs first or the 30 runs first. You can have a 30 running and then they could create a 60. That's still one use and you would still get residuals. As soon as the first version of those mechanical edits airs, that's going to trigger a residual payment. Um, if they then later make another, a shorter edit later on, and they add additional uses than what they originally intended, then at the end of the cycle, they have to pay you what's called an upgrade fee, where you'll get the additional of whatever they should have paid you if they had done it correctly the, at the beginning. Um, but no, it doesn't matter which length edit goes first. They have to pay as 15 businesses after whatever it is airs, you have to get your residual check. Uh, question is, when will uh, cable be improved to reflect the massive increase in usage, usage and viewership compared to network? 
This is um, something that all performers are concerned about because, yeah, cable is, you know, everyone watches cable. Everyone, you know, networks, there's a handful of them, but there are hundreds of cable stations. Uh, we did get a, a, a good increase in the last negotiations, and, um, you know, we understand and the, that the performers are concerned about overexposure. And again, the cable payment, it's a one-time payment covering 13 weeks, unlimited use. But again, you know, that was that was addressed in the negotiations and, you know, the performers, the members of the commercial uh, committee who were there at negotiations agreed to the payment. It was a good increase and we were happy with it. And the committee was happy with it as well. So, you know, the next go around, this is something I should bring up. If you have concerns or issues with the commercial contract, probably about a year uh, eight months to a year prior to the uh, contract terminating, we have what we call uh, wages and working conditions. That's where anyone who is a, a current member, they come in and sit with staff and they throw out ideas what they want. We, we ask, we, you know, this, this contract is negotiated and written by the members, the performers. We just, we are the ones that go to the table with the industry, but it's all member driven. So you come in and you say, you know what, I want my meal five within five hours, not six hours. And all of these issues are brought up. I'm not paid enough for cable. I'm getting overexposed. I needed, you know, all of these things are brought up by the members and taken into consideration, talked and discussed with the group, with the staff and the other members that, that are there. And we bring to the table a package of the most, you know, areas of concern. So if you want anything changed, absolutely come to the wages and working conditions uh, go to the sag after website everything's posted everything uh, we have caucuses and we have work groups so it's it's very important if you want something changed come and be heard oh, we have no more questions we must have questions oh i have more oh did you want <laughs> no, but that's if they don't give them a principal contract. Oh, oh, right. Okay. I didn't read the question. Okay. <laughs> I read the claim. I promise. Um, this question. Okay. First of all, the first question is: How long does it take to get a check forwarded on from SAG, and why so long? If that <laughs> if that means residual checks. We don't get residual checks. Only TV theatrical residual checks come through the union. The, the commercial checks go directly from the payroll company to either you or your agent, whoever you put on your contract. So um, they're not coming, that, that's not us. If it's because it's a claim, it's just taking so long because that's how long it's taking to resolve the claim. And as, believe me, as soon as we get the checks in, we copy them and get them out. We do not want them sitting on our desks and getting lost. Um, so we don't have anything to do with the residual checks. Your best bet is call um, the number of the payroll company that issues your session check. There's always a number on it. Call them, tell them who the advertising agency is and who the product is, what the product is. They'll get you in touch with the um, accounting person who handles the, bill, the payment for that and they'll be able to tell you if checks have gone out and they're lost in the mail, if they had the wrong address or if they haven't been authorized to cut checks yet. I have a non-deductible uh, breakfast question. So if the talent call time is 7.30 a.m. and the crew is 9.30 a.m., are we due a penalty if lunch is at 3.40 p.m.? Uh, a non-deductible breakfast was called at 9.30. So from 9.30 to 3.30, that would be the six hours. Um, so it's like 10 minutes into if there was a take that was being finished. Um, I mean, really, you would have been due a meal at 3.30 but if there was a take issue, they had to finish that, then, you know, 340. But they did provide the non-deductible uh, breakfast at, uh, what time was it? 9.30, which is what they do. A lot of times they use that non-deductible breakfast to align 
the crew call and the performers. It's used a lot for that reason. Yes. Okay, there's a question that was sent in um, from the web about living in New Jersey and driving. I know the 30 mile zone here in LA. Um, I would recommend that you, if you have questions about specifically about travel in New York and New Jersey, Connecticut area, call the New York office. It's so unique um, how it is in Manhattan and how far you're outside New Jersey and is New Jersey part of Manhattan and all of that. So definitely call the office um, and they'll be able to explain that to you in detail. Also, um, you are supposed to get double time on the weekends. If you were not, if ever you hear anything that we're saying that you have not been paid or you read something in the contract, you have six months to file a claim. So notify your, whatever your local office is, um, or if you don't have a local anymore, New, either the New York office or the LA office, and we will get a claim going for you to make sure that you were paid properly under the contract. Yeah, and just uh, to know, when you do file a claim, you know, we don't divulge your name. We, um, anytime we file a claim, we try and do it anonymously. And we do it on behalf of all performers in, in like circumstances. So for example, if you're not paid your session fee, we will um, contact the ad agency and it's for all performers. We're not gonna say, you know, Tracy Hyman filed a claim because, you know, we don't wanna point anybody out. The only time that we may have to, I mean, even in upgrade situations, if a performer files an upgrade claim, we'll contact the ad agency, ask them for all versions of the commercial, a final cast list, and a list of downgrades and upgrades. And <clears throat> then we'll see if our performer is, was on that list for upgrades. If not, we'll review the commercial. If indeed they're entitled to an upgrade, we'll contact the ad agency, and we'll say after reviewing the tape and the materials that you provided to us, it appears that the performer at 30 seconds wearing a green shirt with her hair in a bun should have been upgraded to a principal. Or if they give us Polaroids, we can identify the performer, you know, Tracy Hyman at 30 seconds should have been upgraded. So, you know, we, we do our best to protect the performers. We don't wanna, we never say so-and-so filed a claim. No, no. Um, this one says, I'm repped by commercial agents under ATA. They tell me it takes a month to get my session check, which I have a problem with. Does SAG talent have a right to have checks sent, li sent directly to them when filling out their contract on set if they don't want to wait a month? Um, the situation with that is that's really the agreement between the performer and your agent. Um, if they are a SAG French SAG franchised agent, they only have a certain number of days to hold your check before mailing it to you. Um, but again, if you have an agreement with your agent that says, you know, for every job that I book you on, the checks come to this office. A lot of times there's that agreement. And so, you know, I'm, they're not gonna be very happy with you if on set you put your address and then, you know, if you don't give them the commission. Not that you wouldn't, but we've had agents call and say, you know, performer changed the address, they're going to their home now and we're not getting our commission. So, you know, check with your agreement with your agent. Okay, all right, uh, thank you so much for coming.